right. Thank you for joining us for another daily live stream from here at the Tennessee Aquarium. We are in our Penguins Rock Gallery, and this is Laura Beth Lee. Laura Beth is our senior aviculturist, and today we're going to just talk about everything penguin. Uh, obviously, these are some very charismatic animals. They've got a lot of interesting behaviors. They're a fan favorite. I feel like when guests come here, this is a place that you tend to see a lot of people congregating. And Laura Beth, how long have you been working with penguins? I've been uh, here since we got our birds in 2007, so going on 13 years. And some of the birds that are still here with us are some of those original penguins that came here back in 2007. So um, I feel like I know these guys better than uh, almost anybody that works with them here. So a lot of different personalities, a lot of older birds in their Are you done? All right. That's Merlin. He's one of our loudest macaronis. Um, but yeah, so we have some younger birds in here, some older birds. We have a nice mix of uh, penguins in here, and they are doing well. Life for them is same old, same old, and it's kind of routine in here, and I think they're uh, definitely uh, enjoying their ice cubes today. You can probably see got ice cubes and snow around the exhibit, so that was their enrichment today. And they are still playing with that. Right. Well, as, as we talk with uh, Laura Beth, if those of you who are watching, thank you for joining us. But if you have any comments or questions for Laura Beth, go ahead and post them down in the comments. And I will do my best to answer in between penguins making the loudest noise you could possibly imagine in this echo chamber. Uh, but I guess one of the first questions we should probably ask Laura Beth is for people who have never been here before, because we probably have some people who are watching who have never visited. What species of penguins do we have in here? Because they, there are two, obviously two very different kinds of penguins here. Yeah, so we have macaronis, which that's chaos right there going by, and we have gentoos. So gentoos are going to be the bigger birds that have the white markings on top of their head, and they have yellow beaks and feet, and they're probably the third largest in size. So these guys average around 15 to 20 pounds. Now there's a really big difference in the top three species of penguins. You have your emperors and your kings and your so there's a big stair-step difference between those top three. But gentoos are actually famous for something, and that's for being the fastest swimming bird in the world. So they can go about 22 miles an hour under the water. And then our macaronis are our smaller ones. Those are the ones that were screaming just a second ago. They have the yellow feathers on top of their head, and they are excellent jumpers and climbers. So they've actually been called the alpine penguins. And these guys like to be at the highest point in our exhibit. They like to climb to the top of the rocks and kind of keep an eye on everybody. Um, they're a lot less interested in interacting with people as they are interacting with each other. They're much more dynamic as a social group with each other, whereas the gentoos usually like to come right up to us and stand right beside us and want to know exactly what we're doing every second of the day. And who is this in front of us? This is Flower right here. So she'll open her mouth and kind of kiss a little bit. And... There you go. That's an example of macaroni screaming. Um, but yeah, Flower just really likes to be side by side near us. And you can, we can tell them apart by the bands they have on. So Flower is the only Gentoo with purple bands. This is her son, uh, Beaker, in the green and purple. So we can look at every single bird very quickly and easily and be able to identify them. And that comes in really handy if we need to feed them or give them vitamins or medicine. Or what we're getting ready for is breeding season. So we need to know which birds are pairing together so we can keep track of chicks in here. So you mentioned earlier that it's obviously, it's, it's important for the birds to, to kind of maintain the status quo, to keep their, their schedule going. So as you talk about, about nesting season, that's something we do every year. That's, that's not something that's special just because of the circumstances surrounding. Oh no, absolutely not. We had our breeding schedule set in place for more than a year. So we knew exactly when we were going to do some physicals on all of the birds, make sure they're healthy going into breeding season, and we knew our rock date um, months and months and months ago. So uh, everything's gonna go according to plan. A lot of these guys have already had their physicals to make sure they're healthy. We have a few more to do. We'll be doing that next week. 
Um, if you tune into our webcam next Wednesday, you're not going to see any penguins during the middle of the day because they're going to be getting all of the, their physicals done and we'll be cleaning this exhibit. And then on April 2nd, which is a Thursday, that's rock day. That's the exciting day here. They're going to get nesting rocks um, and they'll be able to start building their nests. Now, this is why they like the um, this is why they like the ice so much is because they can actually pretend that it's nesting material and they can practice building their nest. Ah, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, Christy Hofarth, and again, I'm going to go ahead and just apologize because I am undoubtedly going to butcher some names in the process of doing this stream, so forgive me ahead of time, but she would like to know, what kind of training do you have to do to, to do your kind of work? Her daughter aspires to work with animals. Yeah, so um, everybody that works here at the aquarium comes from different backgrounds. Having a background in science, studying science in high school and college is very important because it gives you a basic understanding of animals. But a lot of folks that work here have majors that don't necessarily on paper translate to working with animals. I have a theater degree. Other folks have art history majors. Um, so we come from a lot of different backgrounds. Very loud. And, yes, and most of my day is spent cleaning up after them. So you have to be willing to get your hands dirty, but the reward is getting to work with these guys. And not a lot of people get to say that they work one-on-one -on -one with penguins. So it is, um, it's a very special job, and it's my dream job. All right, so we have, uh, that was one excellent question. I know there are a lot of you out there who are watching who are home with kids, and if you have kids who have questions, it doesn't matter what that question is, please type it down in the comments because Laura Beth would be very happy to answer it, and I would love to pass it on to her. So please, please put those comments down there, and I will read them out as they come in. Uh, Natalie Watson asks, do you work with different animals or just the penguins? I do work with different animals. So I'm an aviculturist, and that just generally re refers to birds. So penguins are my main focus, my main area here at the aquarium. But we have a few songbirds. We have an owl, and we have a crow. Um, and so we have other animals that I interact with. And of course, a lot of us kind of cross-train. So I can help out with shows and things with the otters and with the lemurs and um, just be able to get different experience. But the penguins are my main focus. Another question from Brandy Moore Burdick, who asked, what do they eat at the aquarium? This is from Brayden, age 13. Yeah, so penguins love fish. Now, penguins out off the coast of Antarctica eat mostly krill and squid, but our birds are picky, and they would rather have fish. And the main reason is because these guys can eat one to two pounds of food per day on a normal day. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is Bacon right here that's, that's got the camera focused on her. She um, only weighs about 8 pounds. Now if she eats 2 pounds of fish a day, that's 25% of her body weight. So just do the math. For those of you trying to work on your math, this is a good math problem. Try and figure out how much you would end up eating if you ate 25% of your body weight every single day. So these guys eat a lot, and it would take thousands of krill in order to equal that amount of food that they need but it may only take 30 or 40 fish. So they prefer the fish and they get capelin, they get herring and they get smelt. And I would say probably the herring is their all time favorite. It's a really big fish. It's actually about 10 to 12 inches long most of the time. And they can swallow that whole. And these guys like bacon, she can eat three or four in a row. So it's incredibly impressive how they put away that food. She set kind of a record last year, it seemed she like. She did, yeah. She actually ate 104 fish in one day, which was 50% of her body weight. Now, the reason she did, she ate that much, is because they go through a molt once a year where they grow a brand new set of feathers. And before they molt, they stock up and they build up some extra fat so they don't have to worry about going in the water when they're big and fluffy and not as warm and not as fast. And that's why she was eating that amount. But she looked like a little bowling ball in right here. She could barely move. It was really funny to watch her. But once she was done with her molt, she was back down to a normal size and eating her normal amount. 
If I remember, I've got a picture of, uh, of Bacon from, from back when she did that, and, and the difference between what you're seeing now and then is pretty staggering. I'll try and post yes. that down in the comments later. Uh, some more questions have come in. Laura Tippin would like to know which one is the oldest penguin. Our oldest penguin is Peach. She's actually right here. She's 29 years old in the hot pink bands. And she shows no sign of her age. With penguins, we watch for the, basically the same things that we're looking for in humans or in dogs or in cats. We want to make sure that they are able to stay mobile. Arthritis is something that we keep an eye on. Um, and of course, as they get older, females might have trouble laying two eggs every single year. With Peep, that's the only age-related thing that we see. She's laid one egg for the past few years instead of two. Other than that, she is tough. If anybody tries to steal her man, she will chase them out of the picture. Um, so she is she's doing fantastic. And that's her mate there, Poncho, and he's in his mid-20s as well. All right, so uh, Brett Pierce asks, who is the naughtiest penguin and what do they do? <laughs> oh, well, that just depends on the day. Uh, they all have their quirks. Uh, Pedro, he's our youngest. He's right here. He's got one flipper out. For some reason, he always sticks one flipper to, out to the side and keeps the other one tucked. Um, it's just a funny quirk that he has. But you can't tell at the moment, but his entire back is really roughed up. All of his feathers are askew because he doesn't quite know how to take care of himself right now and he likes to go over and kind of pick fights and poke at other birds and he doesn't take care of his feathers so he looks like a rough and tumble teenager right now. Uh, Marcy, oh I'm not even going to try. Uh, Luca, age five, asks what are they going to play with today? Yeah, today, so th today they got ice cubes and snow and we give them enrichment every single day so we actually have a calendar. Um, sometimes it's popsicles, sometimes it's ice cubes, sometimes it's a sprinkler. So they've already had their enrichment for today. But not only do they get enrichment that we bring out here, but we also let them explore our backup area. The areas where uh, we get their food ready and everything, we can let them wander around back there um, while, we're, while we're cleaning in the morning. And that's really good enrichment for them too. Uh, Christy Fielder asks on behalf of Micah, age seven, do the penguins have names? And you've been dropping a lot of names, so yeah. what, what's interesting to me about this, and I'll let you answer, is that you not only know their names, but you definitely know their personalities. Oh, yeah. These guys, they're all so different. I can tell you stories about every single one. But yeah, they do all have names. I don't know that every single bird responds to their names. We don't work on a lot of name training, but several of them know their names for sure. We'll call them in here and they'll, they'll look up. They're used to hearing that name. So this is Flower, again, in the purple. We've got um, Peep and Poncho, I mentioned already, pink and yellow. Uh, next to them, their neighbors are Beaker and Roxy. And we've got little Cheddar making his way over here. So they do all have names. Um, and we use those because it's really easy to identify, to point them out by a name. And people like names, so they're, it's really fun for uh, someone to go, well, we watch Cheddar every time we come by, and we watch him on the webcam, so it's really fun to be able to point him out. So we should uh, probably talk about, you mentioned breeding season, obviously the end result of breeding season, hopefully, is chicks. Yeah. So do we have a chicken here? Uh, we have, Pedro is our one chick. Um, Penguins grow really fast, so he was hatched last summer, so that makes him about nine months old now, but they're adult size by the time they're three months, so they don't look like babies for very long. So, yes, if we uh, put our rocks out in April, we expect to see eggs in May, and it takes a little bit over a month for those eggs to hatch. So we potentially start to see chicks early June. It's usually later in June that we start to see chicks. And then they take 75 days before they can actually leave the nest. So breeding season will stretch on for months. It kind of feels like years for us by the end of it because um, they're very messy during breeding season. They have nests filled up, you know, full of rocks and we have to still try and clean around those and, and they're guarding their nests. So uh, summertime is, is the most um, intense year for us. But it's also the most exciting because we end up with babies. Nicholas Rexford would like to know, do you have a favorite penguin and why? That's really hard. Just, uh, it's like asking a parent what their favorite kid is. You might have one, but you can never admit it out loud. So, um, one of my favorite penguins is actually our first gentoo chick that ever hatched. Her name was Shivers. 
and she hatched here in 2010. Now she doesn't live here anymore. She actually lives at another zoo because we move our birds around to make sure we keep the genetics really healthy. So she is off somewhere else. Hopefully she's had some chicks of her own um, and she's doing really well. So it's very hard for me to pick a favorite in here. To, um, for the birds, they play favorites with our staff. So Flower, I'm probably one of her favorites, and Bacon as well. So they like to just kind of stand right next to me. All right, uh, I'm not gonna try and pronounce your name. Uh, Aaliyah, your last name, I'm sorry, but uh, Lucy, she's asking, Lucy wants to know if penguins run. Penguins do run. They look really funny when they run because they're not meant for moving on the land. They have actually longer legs than what it looks like, but because of their body shape, they're built like a football, they don't move very gracefully on the land. But yes, they do run, and if they are chasing one another, it's very funny to watch them go back and forth across the exhibit. Right. Brandy Moore Burdick would like to know, on behalf of Anna Claire, age 10, do they like hot water? No, they don't like hot water. So these guys need to be where it's cold. So their water is actually 42 degrees, and it's I'm all bundled up because it's about 45 degrees in here. Um, so they need to stay nice and cold. They're basically wearing they're basically wearing a heavy winter jacket. And you wouldn't be comfortable wearing that winter jacket outside in the summer or somewhere where it's nice and toasty. So they need it to be nice and cool. Anything about 55 degrees or cooler is good for them. All right. Uh, Joanne LeBounty wants to know, uh, my son is autistic and wants to work with animals. Do you employ people with disabilities? We do, absolutely. And the aquarium actually has some really good programs for um, folks with disabilities. We also have homeschool programs. We do a lot to make sure that everybody gets to experience everything here. Um, and working with animals is one of those things that it doesn't really matter what your abilities are. If you're willing to work and you're willing to um, watch and interact with these guys, then it's something that everybody would do. A big part of our um, job, especially during the breeding season, is just watching and observing animals. That's how we learn so much about their personalities and how they interact with one another. So if you're interested in something like that, the best thing that you can do, you can do this at home right now since you're not able to visit us here, you can sit out in your backyard and start watching the birds in your backyard and start taking notes of the kind of birds that you see, where you see them going to eat, watch for their interactions because this is nesting time for those birds in your backyard too. So you're going to see some aggression from female birds trying to build a nest and keep everybody else away. And you're going to see males showing off for females. And so there's a lot that you can sit and observe and watch right in your backyard. And that'll help you for a career in animals. And for those of you who are watching, obviously you're watching this live, but if you would like to keep up with our penguins, we do have a live cam that uh, shows what's going on in the gallery at all times. Uh, Laura Beth mentioned that that will be going down briefly uh, in a little bit so we can get ready for nesting season. But uh, with that rare exception, you can tune in anytime you want if you go to tnaqua.org and look for our live cameras. We have a live camera in Penguins Rock, so you can check in on them anytime you want. Yeah, and it's, it's only going to be down till, um, from probably Tuesday the 24th that afternoon till Wednesday the very next day. And we'll put it back up as soon as the birds get back out here. So everyone will be able to see them. And then again, rocks will go out the week after that. So it's going to be a lot of excitement on the webcam when the rocks go out. Okay. Uh, so there are a lot of questions. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up here. Oh. Lexi Matt, uh, Melton asks, on behalf of Addison, age 7, which penguin is the meanest? The meanest, well, nobody's really mean. We don't like to say they're mean. A lot of them just have a lot more attitude than others. Um, I will tell you when it comes to feeding time, that's the one time that their um, tempers kind of come out a little bit. They don't always like to share. Mom. This little, I'll say sweetheart, because she's not, she's not mean. Um, Roxy in the red and the orange, she's probably the most tricky one to deal with at feeding time. She likes to, you've probably heard the expression, someone gets really hungry and they get hangry, she's the opposite. So she comes up and she eats maybe 40 fish and then she stays right there where she is. She doesn't let anybody else come up to the pan and she just turns into this little guard dog almost. So we do have to keep an eye on her. Um, when they're nesting, we also want to make sure we give them plenty of distance because they still have those natural instincts. Nobody's really being mean, but they're being protective. All right, uh, Mac Lundy would like to know on behalf of Trillium, age five, how cold does it need to be for the penguins to live comfortably? Yeah, so anything below 
below 55 is good. We keep it in the 40s all year long, and that's like a spring or summertime temperature. They can handle colder weather, but they can't handle anything above 55. All right. The little love nips down here. He's, he's nibbling nice now. Let me know if it is a little more aggressive. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. So let me catch up on some of the other questions. Uh, Lori Shad asks, uh, says, this is Eleanor. Uh, what else do you give them to play with? So we mentioned ice earlier. Yeah. So they get a lot of different things. Everything we give them, we make sure is safe for them. So our vet will tell us yes or no. They get um, basketballs and footballs. We can put those in the water and they'll float and they can push them around. They love the sprinkler, so we can connect a sprinkler in here. They love popsicles and we can freeze fish and food coloring together and put it in the water. Um, they really love the snow. They love the ice cubes. Sometimes I'll put, a couple days ago, I put a giant tub in here and filled it full of ice. And Bigfoot, our younger bird, just decided he was just going to stand in there and that was going to be his spot. So he stood in there for hours. He even fell asleep in there. So they get a variety of things, um, sometimes bubbles. Sometimes we even do things on the outside of the exhibit. We'll put like window things on the windows and they can kind of try and investigate from this side. It's not something they can actually get to, but they can kind of play with and try and try and get to it. Uh, Pamela McGill Prince would like to know what is the age for volunteers? Yeah, for our Pico volunteers, I believe you have to be 18 years old just because the exhibit in here is a little slippery. Um, but we start volunteers as young as 14. Some of those volunteers work with our summer camp groups. Some of them go through a few training courses and they can work at the touch tanks or throughout the um, aquarium answering questions for guests. And we also have areas, other areas you can become a volunteer too. They'll have different age requirements. Um, you can help with plants, you can help prep food. If you are dive certified, we actually have volunteer divers as well. So all of that information is going to be on our website. Um, I believe there's a tab that says get involved and it'll link you right up to what you need to do. Uh, Katie Lamb says that from this angle, the space seems a little small. Do they have more space behind the scenes, or is this actually a good... I can't actually expand the comment, but I'm guessing, is this space sufficient for the number of birds we have? Yeah, you know, we get that question a lot, but one thing we have to keep in mind, and, and this is a very appropriate time to, to bring it up, we're trying to keep ourselves distant from everybody else, but penguins don't do that at all. If you were to see pictures of penguins in Antarctica or travel to Antarctica, there's going to be a colony of 100,000 penguins and they're gonna be about one to two square feet uh, away from their neighbors. They actually build their nest close enough where they can steal rocks off their neighbor's nest without even moving. So they want to be close together. So we actually have enough land and water space for 30 birds, and currently we have around 20. So we like to keep our numbers under 25. Once we have chicks and we hit that 25, then we start kind of making arrangements to move some of our birds out to other zoos and aquariums. That gives them the chance to breed and it keeps us from becoming overcrowded. But they do have plenty of space and what you can't tell is behind Casey, maybe she can kind of sweep over that way, we've got one bird hanging out over there. They've got all this land space and they're choosing to be all together on this one side. So they, they definitely like to have closer quarters than we do. Well, and it doesn't help that I'm kind of focusing in one direction. Uh, so there is a lot of gallery behind me that you're not seeing. Yeah, and they have 18,000 gallons of water. So they have caves they can swim in. They, they, they pretty much have it made in here. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rachel Witness, and this actually is a nice segue from the previous question, uh, asks, where do you get your birds? Yeah, so uh, when we originally decided to open Penguins Rock, we contacted SeaWorld because SeaWorld keepers are penguin experts. They are some of the original scientists that went out and studied these guys in the 70s and 80s. And what they did is they brought eggs back from Antarctica back in the 80s, and they hatched penguins from there. And so our birds are second and third generation penguins that hatch from those original eggs. And so we contacted SeaWorld, and they have been transporting animals back and forth before. So our keepers actually met with them in two different locations at, in Pittsburgh, at the Pittsburgh Zoo, where some of the penguins were living, and in SeaWorld San Antonio. And they, our keepers drove back with their keepers and the birds, and they came here, and their keepers stuck around for a few days, answered questions for us, got made sure the birds had gotten used to their exhibit, and then from there, um, some of our birds still belong to SeaWorld, some of them are on loan to us, and some of the birds we own. And kind of move them around, like I mentioned before, to keep the genetics healthy. We can communicate with any zoo um, and aquarium throughout North America and make sure we're keeping this population.
population healthy. All right. Uh, Lisa Marie would like to know, why do you like penguins? Why do I like penguins? Penguins are fun to work with, and they give you a lot of attitude, and they give you a lot of sass, but they also give you a lot of, uh, a lot of respect, and it's, it's hard. If you are an animal lover, if you have a dog or a cat at home, you know that oftentimes animals are so unconditionally devoted to us. Um, even though these are not pets, these are animals that you know, we take care of here at the aquarium, they often, we often don't deserve them. They're often a lot better than we are. So getting the chance to work with these guys up close and just being able to provide the best possible care for them is a really satisfying thing for me. So I know that whatever I'm doing in here um, is directly helping them out. There's actually a quote, and it's a quote we have framed in our penguin backup area, and I love it. And it says, our quality of work is their quality of life. So it lets me know that what I'm doing every day is directly impacting them. So it makes me want to do the best I can because that's what they have on each day. Uh, Andrea Faith would like to know on behalf of, I'm guessing this is pronounced Julieta, and if I messed it up, I apologize, age 10, why does the macaroni penguin have yellow hair? Yeah, so that's actually how they got their name, macaroni. So they have those little fe yellow feathers on top of their head, and you can get a close-up of the chaos around the penguin. So they, uh, those feathers actually refer to men back in England who would wear feathers in their caps, and they were called macaroni dandies. If you've ever seen, um, sing the song Yankee Doodle, there's a line, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. And that just refers to men who would wear those feathers in their caps. So the first explorers to see macaroni penguins were reminded of those men back in Europe, and that's how they got their name. Okay. Uh, Deanna would like to know, who do you think the clumsiest penguin is? <laughs> Definitely Bigfoot. Um, he's very appropriately named. He's our younger bird. He's kind of got his uh, back to us right now. But he, uh, he oftentimes doesn't sit with his feet straight. He kind of overlaps them. And then when he starts to go moving, he trips over his own feet. So Bigfoot is a very appropriate uh, name for him. So, and they're all a little bit clumsy when they're getting ready for molting and they put on that extra weight. They can't jump as high or move as fast. So it's kind of kind of funny to see them kind of moving around when they're big and, big and chubby. Uh, Sharon Eves would like to know, have you ever fallen into the water in the exhibit? <laughs> I have not, but a few people have so it's just a matter of time i've made it 13 years i don't know how long it'll take before i fall in but it will happen eventually and the gallery is full of ice cubes today so <laughs> all right uh let's see mallory messer smith messer smith would like to know do the penguins sleep standing up they do they can sleep standing up they can sleep on their bellies they can sleep on their heels with their toes in the air so it really depends on the bird what's more comfortable for them and also where they're nesting some of these guys choose these really awkward uncomfortable rocks to sleep on top of but for them it must feel great um, this guy here poncho here in the yellow he's usually our last one to wake up in the morning he likes to lay flat on his belly and he doesn't want to move until we absolutely make him get up and, and get moving for the day uh, let's see, Nicole Taylor would very understandably like to know on behalf of Madison, why do they make that noise? That is how they communicate. So birds are really vocal. If you go outside right now, even if it's raining, it's raining here in Chattanooga, but you'll still hear birds calling and that's how they communicate. We're a very vocal species and so are they. And so they do a lot of yelling. They're saying, this is my nesting spot. This is my mate. Maybe they're trying to attract their mate over to a certain area. So they're just very vocal and they like to talk. All right. Uh, Susie Dupree would like to know, what do the different color bands on their wings mean? You kind of touched on this, but some yeah. people are joining us later than others. Yeah, so it's just basically a way to keep track of them. So each bird has a different color. Some have two colors, but it's just like a name tag. It doesn't hurt them at all. We can make sure they're never too tight or too loose. We can change them throughout the year if needed. And once they're used to them, it's just like when you wear a watch or a bracelet, you forget it's even on. And it helps us be able to tell them apart, even from a distance. Uh, Lexi Milton is asking for Addison, age seven, uh, which one of the penguins is the nicest? There are a lot of questions about personality, but I mean, these are very charismatic birds. Yeah, well, they, they are, and it all depends on um, the, the situation. Um, for example, one of our sweetest birds in here toward people is Noodle. She's a little blue banded macaroni. However, I have seen her chase gentoos out of their nest and, and knock an egg out of its nest. So she's tough when she needs to be. So it all really just depends. 
a bacon right here that he was just filming. She's pretty sweet. And she gave me then. We'll see if she'll even stand up here for a second. Oh, you're heavy right now. So see, she enjoys this. And I'm never going to pick up a bird um, that doesn't want to do this. She enjoys being up close to us. She likes sitting on her knee. She likes being up high. And she's very comfortable with this. Cheddar right here, even though he seems interested, he would not be comfortable sitting on my knee like that. So I know the birds. I know what they're comfortable with, what they are interested in. Um, and she's, she's a pretty sweet little bird. And something you just said is probably something that we should touch on because uh, a lot of how you interact with the animals and, and how all of our animal care specialists interact with the animals is all about choice. Yeah, exactly. We never want to make any animal do something they're not comfortable with. So we give them a lot of opportunities to try new things. <laughs> See, and these two are a little bit jealous. Flower wants my attention. Bacon's got it. So I'm going to put bacon down over here. It's always their choice. They get to choose whether or not they want to do something, whether or not they want to play with enrichment, whether or not they want to come into our backup area, or whether or not they're comfortable letting me touch their bands or touch their back, or flower will even let me open the mouth so I can see inside of it. So there are birds that are comfortable with that and there are birds that are not, and that's totally fine. Uh, we work really hard to make sure we know each bird individually, and we keep them comfortable and keep them happy. Uh, Natalie Griffith Black asks on behalf of Elliot, age six, do the penguins go to the bathroom in the water or on land? And I wish that I'd had the camera because it's kind of been everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. So they go to the bathroom in the water and it's constantly filtered like a big giant fish tank. They go to the bathroom on the land. You can see it on the ground behind them or there. Um, penguins, it's pretty funny. Penguins do something called projectile pooping. And it sounds hilarious, but that's basically what it is. Think about it, if they're sitting in their nest, they don't want to go to the bathroom right there in their nest because there's going to be a, kind of a, a horrible pile by the, of, of poop by the end of breeding season. So they kind of poop away from their nest. And uh, if you're in here and you're not wearing the proper clothing and you're standing in the wrong place, you can get it right on you. So you do have to be aware of where you are. Yeah, you can see actually a streak kind of right behind us. Yeah. That white stuff, that is poop. All right. Um, uh, Maggie, age six, would like to know uh, how many steps a penguin takes in a day. I don't know how you would know that. Oh, yeah. You know, um, they're not really an animal we could put a pedometer on and measure, but I would imagine these guys probably do more swimming than they do walking in here because they're much more graceful in the water. Um, it wouldn't be anywhere near close enough to what we walk in a day but they're actually much more comfortable in the water. So I bet they're, if you could measure how many, how much time they spend swimming versus how much time they spend walking, that would probably be a little bit more accurate. Yeah. Well, and that'd be a good thing for you to check out on the live cam. Uh, as we've mentioned a couple times already, the, there is a live cam in this exhibit. You could do your own observations from home and see how, what kind of time split there is between how much time the penguins are on the land and how much they're in the water. Yeah. That would be a good scientific uh, activity to take part in. Uh, Melvin Lawson wants to know how many fish do they eat per day? Yeah, so it really just depends on the bird and the size of the fish. If I'm feeding out herring, they only eat about four or five because those herring are really big, again, 10 to 12 inches long. Um, if they're eating capelin, some of these guys can eat 60 capelin a day. That's two or three pounds of food. This guy, Poncho, I know we've focused on him a lot, but he's our biggest guy. He's also our pickiest eater. He does not eat every single day. Since we hand feed our birds, we actually keep track of what each one is eating. It's a really good way to kind of know that everybody's healthy and doing good. But it also teaches us about their feeding habits. Most of them are going to eat the same amount of fish every day, but Poncho maybe only eats five days a week, and the other two days he might not eat anything, maybe one fish, maybe two, but on the days he chooses to eat, it might be 75 fish. He'll just kind of load himself down, and then he's good for a day or two. Um, so they all have different feeding patterns. Most of them actually prefer the afternoon feeding versus the morning, so it just it kind of depends on the bird. And this exhibit actually will be fed uh, pretty soon after this live stream yeah. ends, so not to keep plugging the, the live cam, but if you want to watch the, uh, you know, them being fed, you can actually do that by going to our website, tnaqua.org, and checking the live cam. 
Uh, Nicole Taylor says, uh, asking a lot of good questions, Alyssa wants to know, can they fly because they are birds? They, they are birds, but they cannot fly. Not all kind of birds can fly. Ostriches can't fly, emus can't fly, penguins don't fly. The one thing that makes a bird different than any other animal is that they have feathers. And I know it doesn't really look like they have feathers, but their feathers are so close together, they have 80 per square inch. And that makes it look more like a diaper's wetsuit rather than feathers. But they are covered in feathers. The reason a penguin can't fly is kind of twofold. Number one, they don't really need to. Their food comes from the water. So they need to be able to swim. They don't really need to cover distances flying. But the second reason has to do with their swimming. If you're a lightweight bird and you're light enough to fly, you're not going to be strong enough to dive down deep and go after the fish. For some of these guys, they have to dive between four and 600 feet down just to find food at different times of the year. And they have to be heavy enough in order to do that. So if you look at these guys in here, they're not much different in, different in height than an owl that you might see in your backyard, but they're way different in weight. Cheddar here may be similar to a barred owl that you might find in your backyard. That was poop, you just missed poop. Yes. <laughs> But Cheddar, he weighs about nine or 10 pounds, and that owl in your backyard is gonna weigh two or three. So there's a very big difference in how their bones are structured and how much muscle they have, because these guys need to be able to swim. All right, well, Laura Beth, I know that we're probably closing in on the time that you need to start getting these guys ready to have their food. Uh, I'll ask a couple more questions, and then we'll go ahead and end the stream, but uh, please, Keep in mind that uh, as this period of unprecedented, you know, social distancing is happening and you all are stuck at home, many of you with children, use us as a resource. We're trying to put out as many of these live streams as we can. We're connecting you with animal experts. We're putting up fun animal videos. We've got a lot of resources available that are available at any time for you to do activities at home with your kids. We've mentioned the live cam several times. So please, you know, turn to us because we're, we're still here. We're still doing our jobs. Laura Beth is here basically every day. We were talking before the stream. She's still on a normal schedule because these birds need to be on the same schedule as always for their own well-being. And, you know, there, there are a lot of needs during this time. We've actually set up an emergency fund. If, if any of you are watching this and feel like you'd like to contribute to the, the people who are taking care of the animals and make sure that everything stays the same for them, we do have an emergency fund set up. You can donate by going to tnaqua.org and clicking on the link there. But uh, asking a couple more questions here, Jennifer would like to know what kind of degree does someone have to have to work with penguins? You touched on that, but if you don't mind going and touching that on yeah, again. Yeah, so any sort of background in science is always going to help when you're talking about working with animals. Um, if you're working with animals in a zoo or an aquarium setting, it's a lot different than if you're working and studying them out in, you know, in the wild, in their natural habitat. You're going to need a lot more scientific background in that case. Uh, but for a lot of us here, we come from different backgrounds. I have a theater degree, we have an art history major, we have some folks who are more in environmental science than, than necessarily biology, but all of us have spent years and years of volunteer time working with animals, and, and we've learned as, as we go. And that's a common thing in the zoo or aquarium world, to have that scientific background, but they're willing to teach you what you need to know. All right. All right, so we have time for, I think, one more question. If anybody wants to type in your questions, I'll choose the one that strikes my fancy, and I will pass it on to Laura Beth, and we'll, we'll end this stream with our, our gratitude and thanks to her for taking the time to talk to us. So type your questions in now. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. I will actually ask two questions because Beth Biddle has, I think, asked this. This is the second time. I've missed a couple questions. Sorry that, that a lot of them have been coming in faster than I'm used to trying to get them out to Laura Beth. So uh, Carl H6 would like to know, do penguins sort objects? You know, we actually haven't worked on that with them. A lot of birds are very smart. Parrots can sort things. Crows, our crow is an amazing, amazing at sorting and finding things. We haven't worked a lot on that, but we have a brand new enrichment item 
and they're bright colored dots and we have been putting them on the floor and trying to get them to stand in a specific location. I think that it might help birds like Roxy who don't always like to be nice at feeding time. Um, and we've noticed they already show preferences to color. So it's something that we can work on in the future because they already can tell a difference in different colors. All right, so uh, the final question I'll ask is Amanda Mitchell wants to know how many baby penguins are born each year there? Yeah, it really just depends. We've had years where we've had none just because eggs are not fertile. Sometimes the eggs they're sitting on are just not fertilized eggs. Um, we've had as many as five. So we really don't know what uh, this year is going to bring. We'll follow recommendations made by our species survival plan, which just ensures that birds that are related are not breeding together. Um, but we may end up with 14 eggs and one chick, or we may end up with 14 eggs and 14 chicks. We're kind of hoping that doesn't happen. We don't need quite that population explosion this year. But um, I feel like we'll get one or two easily. So it'll just be a matter of who are going to be the parents. We'll have to wait and see. So. All right. Well, we'll keep you all updated on all the happenings in Penguins Rock in the coming months. It's, as Laura Beth has said, it's going to be a very exciting time for all of us and for the birds. So keep track of that on the live cam that we've mentioned a few times. And Laura Beth, thank you so much for taking yeah. the time. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Uh, I mentioned it once, but if you do feel the need or would like to donate to the aquarium during this time when a lot of the people uh, aren't here, we don't have any visitors, we are closed. Uh, we would love for you to do that. we are got a, an emergency fund set up. And you can donate at tnaqa.org. In the meantime, do please come and use us as an educational resource or just to relax. We're here to try and help you. If you have any suggestions for content you'd like to see, post it in the comments. I'll be sure to look at that and make plans going forward. But uh, I'll go ahead and end this live stream. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time.